Good afternoon. Welcome to First Congregational Church of Norman UCC, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Uh, my name is Kay Holliday. I'm a member of First Congregational. We welcome you today, whether you are worshiping online or in person. Uh, Reverend Mitch Randall is our guest minister for today, and you will enjoy hearing uh, Dr. Randall. He is CEO of Good Faith Media, and if you haven't checked out Good Faith Media online, please do that. It's full of really good stuff. I hope you'll take time just um, a little bit to, um, sorry I'm out of breath, we were checking the the sign outside, it had cracked in, and so it was like it's hanging down and somebody was uh, um, concerned that it was vandalism, but I think our PVC pipe just broke. So Dan, you're on alert for that. <laughs> uh, take a moment and find your bulletin and the perforated information communication card is important to us to let us know that you are here today. And if you would like to be added to our email list to get weekly information about who is preaching, the sermon title, and any other information is, will be important. So if you would uh, fill that out with any information you feel comfortable sharing with us, fold it in half and put it in the offering plate along with any of your uh, offering that you would like to contribute to our church. We really appreciate that very much. And on the back of your bulletin are announcements. If you would take a look at those and see if there are additional announcements that need to be made. I'll start with one. Tuesday, June the 28th is a very important day in our democracy. And I know that every single person in this congregation is registered to vote. So please go vote. Any other announcements? Uh, we've got notice from Virginia Reynolds' daughter, Vicki, that her memorial service has been scheduled. Uh, I'm waiting to confirm the date on that. It's in August, so we have time to make additional announcements about that. But Virginia was a longtime member of our congregation, and um, we, I know we'll want to uh, remember her. So when we get that date confirmed, in August, we will be sure and let you know when it will be in our bulletin as well. If there are no other bulletins, we will take this time, oh my goodness. We will pretend that I'm bringing the prayer bowl. I got a little distracted with the sign. Oh gosh. Thank you, Mitch Randall. Now I really do need some time to center myself. So as I ring the prayer bowl, please take this opportunity to close your eyes or be centered in this place and be ready to join in our call to worship following.
Please find your call to worship in your bulletin. I will read the light print and you follow in the bold. God of heaven and earth, your people enter your presence seeking justice. We come before you on behalf of those who have been rejected. We seek justice for the murder. We come before you on behalf of those beaten, incarcerated, and killed. We seek justice for your fellow black and brown brothers and sisters. We come before you on behalf of those who have been vilified. We seek justice for our LGBTQIA plus community. We come before you on behalf of those needing health care. We seek justice for women's reproductive rights. We come before you on behalf of those living paycheck to paycheck. We seek justice for income equality. We come before you on behalf of the world you created. We seek justice for the earth and all of her creatures. Therefore, God of justice, let justice roll down like the waters and righteous like an ever-flowing stream. Amen. Now please rise in body or in spirit and turn to page 52, and our hymn is, Oh, How I Love Jesus. One of the great things traveling across the country and preaching at a variety of denominational churches, you get to sing all of these wonderful hymns and everybody has their own interpretation of these hymns. So as I'm sitting there singing, the Baptist came out on me, I realized I didn't have the words right. Uh, so, <laughs> so I stayed to the page. <laughs> uh, it is good to see you today. Would you join me in prayer, please? God of grace, God of mercy, God of justice, love, and hope, your people come before you today with tears in our eyes and our heart cracked. It's been a difficult week. We've seen right after right infringed upon. We've heard stories from individuals and groups that paint a daunting picture of our future. And father, mother, 
Brother, sister, it would be difficult not to be despairing at this time. But God, we firmly believe in you. We believe any time that darkness attempts to descend upon the land, even though the clouds build on the horizon, there is always hope for a sunrise. That there is always hope for which we can cling. And even though it looks blurry, utilizing your eyes, utilizing your vision, things can become clear. But these things will not become clear unless your people rise up to answer your call. Therefore, our ears are open, our hearts are ready, and our feet are anxious to take the steps that are needed to bring back, to move forward, to advocate for your justice, for your inclusion, for your freedom. Lord, show us the way and we will go. Amen. And now is the time for our joys and concerns. Um, it's been a rough week, as Mitch said, so reach down into your pockets and find those joys that you would like to share. I need that repeated, I'm sorry. Absolutely, for lovely breezes and, and cooler weather, we say thanks be to God. Thank you. After, uh, I'd like to share a joy. Yesterday was Oklahoma City Pride Fest. And after the dismal news on Friday, it was an absolute joy to be among the rainbow of humanity of the LGBTQ plus community in Oklahoma City and beyond. Um, our loved ones are frightened to pieces, so it was, we all needed to be together yesterday. It was an absolute joy. There were thousands of people there. And let us say, thanks be to God. Any other joys? Yes, Louise. That's wonderful. For young people who get it, social justice issues, including gun violence prevention. Thank you, Louise. And the, let's say, thanks, thanks be to God. And it's a joy to see my son and his beautiful wife here in the back row, along with Missy Randall. That's quite a joy. Any others? <laughs> And now we turn to uh, concerns, and we do this in a couple of ways. Some are silent, some you might want to speak out loud, and after each one that is spoken out loud, if we can hear them, um, we, we will uh, close with a, a little note of prayer. So what concerns do you have that you might want to keep in your heart silently or voice out loud? I think we all have a lot of concerns that we are keeping in our hearts. 
And dear Holy One, we are thankful that you hear our prayers, both silent and those spoken. Amen. Let us recite together the Lord's Prayer as it is printed in your bulletins. Our Creator, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For you reign in the power that is love, now and always. Amen. Well, today is the last Sunday I will be with you this summer. It has been a joy and honor to be with you over three Sundays. I understand that last week went very well, and Reverend Mike Bumgarter did a fabulous job. He always does. Uh, but uh, I'm going to miss you uh, immensely. Uh, I appreciate uh, Robin giving me the opportunity uh, to preach here at this wonderful and beautiful church. Now, before I begin, I do want to make one uh, observation. If I see anybody looking at their phones during the sermon, I'm going to assume you're looking at scripture and not the baseball game. So. <laughs> I know you good righteous people will be all with me, right? <laughs> Darkness descended upon our land this week as the United States Supreme Court announced a string of dystopian rulings catapulting the country backward. After decades of the religious right working to impose their theological rigidness upon this country, they have succeeded in packing the high court with the majority of justices that support them and their views. Let us recall exactly what happened this week and the court's rulings. One. They removed another brick from the wall separating church and state by allowing religious education in Maine to be funded by taxpayer dollars. Two, they decided that the state of New York needed more people carrying guns in their subways. Three, they sided with insurers in limiting dialysis coverage, opening the door for more challenges to Obamacare and health care in general. And for this last Friday, as we all know, they overturned Roe v. Wade, permitting states like ours to ban abortion, reducing the rights of women to receive safe reproductive health care. And we would be amiss to ignore Justice Clarence Thomas' concurring opinion, where he suggested overturning other due process cases dealing with contraception, same-sex intimate relationships, and gay marriage. And the cherry on top of this dung heap of a week? I had another word for it, and my wife wouldn't let me use it. We discovered how close we truly were to losing democracy if it were not for certain individuals standing with the Constitution rather than a want-to-be dictator. Indeed, it has been a dark week in America. However, I pray to God that we do not give in to despair. We should be outraged. That's a totally appropriate response. But we also need to be inspired. We need to start mobilizing and advocating. We need to re-engage in the political process as a matter of conscience and as of faith. And as the late John Lewis reminded us a long time ago, we must involve ourselves in what he declared as an almost sacred right to vote. It's only going to be through 
confronting and combating these corrupt systems that we have a chance in redeeming them. As the Apostle Paul pointed out in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Theologian Walter Wink, in his extraordinary book, Engaging the Powers, writes, My thesis is that what people in the world of the Bible experienced and called principalities and powers was in fact real. They were discerning the actual spirituality at the center of the political, economic, and cultural institutions of their day. In other words, what Wink was arguing for, that earthly institutions and systems produce a spiritual presence, bringing either hope or despair, light or darkness. When they become corrupt, these institutions of ours, they produce darkness leading to despair. It very much felt like this week, I don't know about you. However, when they are allowed to promote justice, they pose the potential to create freedom, opportunity, and hope. Therefore, corrupt systems can be redeemed, but only through the good faith efforts of those freedom, those who seek freedom and justice for all people. That means us. And this brings me to the text today. In the Gospel of Luke, we find Jesus in eastern Palestine at the city of Gerasenes. After stepping onto the land, he encounters a man that we are told is possessed by demons. Now, while this is certainly a story about Jesus healing the man, we also have come to know that there's always more to tell when Jesus is at work. He heals the man of his infliction, or his infliction, or his, um, in, uh, that word escapes me. <laughs> of his infliction. But he also demonstrates a way to combat corrupt systems and fight for an audacious hope. So let's read this story. It's kind of a long one, but stay with me, if you will. Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Then they, that's Jesus and his disciples, sailed to the country of Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out onto the land, a man from the city met him who was possessed with demons, and he had not put on clothing for a long time, was not living in a house, but among the tombs. And seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What business do you have with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had already commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had seized him many times, and he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard, and yet he would break the restraints and be driven by the demon into the desert. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they were begging him not to command them to go away into the abyss. Now there was a herd of many pigs feeding there on the mountain. And the demons begged him to permit them to enter the pigs, and he gave them permission. And the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. Now when the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran away and reported everything in the city and in the country. And the people came out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man whom whom the demons had gone out, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, and in right mind, they became frightened. Those who'd seen everything reported to them how the man who had been demon-possessed had been made well, and all the people of the territory of Gerasenes and the surrounding region asked him to leave them because they were overwhelmed by great fear, and he got into the boat and returned. But the man, the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging Jesus that he might accompany him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and describe what things God has done for you. So the man went away, proclaiming throughout the city what great things Jesus had done for him. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. Jesus heals the demonic, we are told. 
However, there is much more going on in this story than meets the eye. First, let's talk about location. The region of Gerasenes is in the eastern Palestine, nestled between the Sea of Galilee and the desert wilderness. The area was a trading region filled with fishermen, farmers, artisans, and day laborers. Since the region was not located in the main swath of the land between Galilee in the north and Jerusalem in the south, it was really out of the way. But for some reason, Jesus liked going to these towns that were out of the way. He had a tendency to do this quite often. Have you ever wondered why? Why did Jesus go to these, so, these small, insignificant villages and towns? Why didn't he stick to the big cities? Especially Jerusalem, if he was trying to change the world. Jesus went to these small and out-of-the-way places because that's exactly how Jesus grew up. As we recall from a few weeks ago, Jesus grew up an outsider, a mamzer, you were called, a child of questionable birth. He grew up in the rural village of Nazareth, surrounded by re rebel rousers and agitators. His dad was a day laborer, working from job to job, trying to provide for his family. Jesus understand, or he understood the political oppression dictated by Rome and the religious rigidness of Jerusalem. He knew that they had real-world consequences on the streets where he and his people dwell. You want to know why Jesus went to cities and towns and villages just like this one at Gerasenes, it's because he knew the political rigidness and religious oppression has real consequences for people in the streets. Second, let's talk about the man possessed by demons. The demonic, as, we, as he has unjustly been called throughout history, represents the consequences rendered by the dictates and oppression of empire. It's no coincidence that the demon is called Legion. Legion was a division within the Roman army, numbering about 6,000 infantry with additional cavalry. So the number was much more than 6,000. In other words, the man was suffering at the hands of the institution responsible for keeping the people following the oppressive dictates of empire. Again, institutions can bring real spiritual consequences to those suffering under the power and authority of the empire and those in authority. Yes, Jesus heals this man of his infliction, but he also is trying to bring him out of a system that is oppressive. Third, let's talk about how Jesus upended local corruption. After Legion begs Jesus not to send them into the abyss, they request Jesus relocate them into a herd of swine. Swine! Pigs! Doesn't that leave you scratching your head? What are swine doing in a predominantly Jewish village? Pigs were unclean animals, according to Jewish culture. Why were there so plentiful in this small Jewish village? Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III, pastor of Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, was the first one to point this out to me. He said, after the pigs committed pigicide, the herdsmen knew their illicit activities were over. No longer could they prey on the poor, defiling their religious and cultural identity. In other words, they were engaged in something that was shady and illegal. Therefore, not only did Jesus stand up against the oppression of the empire, he also weeded out local corruption while he was at it. Fourth, why did, the, why did Jesus not let the man go with him? It would have been much easier for the man if he was allowed to leave with Jesus and garner a fresh start. I mean, he could leave all this nonsense behind. and he, could, he wouldn't have to be reminded of his past. He could go and start afresh. Instead, Jesus tells him to remain in Gerasenes and, informs the people about, and inform the people about the justice of God that had been brought about that day. 
If Jesus understood the plight of these people because he was one of them, he also understood the importance of local people bringing about change in their communities. Who else was going to keep track of those herdsmen if they decided to reopen their swine industry? So with these four things that we have gleaned from the text, and hopefully maybe you've gleaned a a thing or two on your own, What are we to do with it after enduring a week like this past one? 1867 British philosopher John Stuart Mill made this remark at the University of St. Andrews many years ago. Bad men need nothing more to compass their ends than that good men should look on and do nothing. Later on, this quote was attributed to Edmund Burke with really without any ample evidence, Burke really didn't say it, but I I like the quote nonetheless. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing. Regardless of who said it, the point remains relevant and crucial in combating corrupt systems. Over the three weeks I have been with you, you have heard me utter this phrase, stand up, speak out, and step forward. To combat corrupt systems and institutions, people of good faith need to stand up, speak up, and step forward now and quickly. The days of quietly fighting corruption are over. For too long, people of good faith have remained timid in the public square, allowing the religious right to dominate the conversation on matters of faith and policy. We have been way too quiet and way too nice. It's time for that to stop. It is time for us to stand and declare courageously, boldly, and often. We are Christians who support reproductive health for women, LGBTQ plus rights, marriage equality, racial justice, voting rights, police and penal justice reform, sensible gun restrictions, lowering carbon emissions to combat global warming, just economic policies that tackle income equality, addressing student debt, and any other issue we think the Lord has a word for these days. And guess what? The Lord does. We must recapture, thus saith the Lord. We cannot afford to be silent any longer. But not only must we stand up and speak out, we need to step out. How do we do this? We go to the streets like we've gone before to protest and march, but we also need to mobilize people to help in situations like we find ourselves in today. And yes, We need to vote. As John Lewis said, as I quoted him a moment ago, for John Lewis, voting was a sacred right of all people. Paul Weyrich, one of the founders of the modern day conservative movement, infamously said one time, how many of our Christians have what I call the goo-goo syndrome, good government? They want everybody to vote. I don't want everybody to vote. Elections are not won by a majority of the people. They never have been from the beginning of our country, and they are not now. As a matter of fact, our leverage in elections, quite candidly, goes up as the voting populace goes down. Therefore, not only do we need to change hearts and minds, we also need to work to make significant changes using the democratic process. Our voice is our vote. We need to elect people that believe in the freedom and rights of all citizens, not just the theological, ideological, and economical powerful. We can bring real change to this world but it will take every one of us doing our part. Like Jesus, we must stand up to empire and local corruption. We must stand with the afflicted, speaking out, letting them amplify their voice, 
and combat corruption where we find it. We are watching, we are openly watching the destruction of democracy play out before our eyes, not in some private room in secret. It's happening right before our eyes. As a small group of powerful people inflict their inhumane views on this country. We can't let that happen. Franklin D. Roosevelt once said, the liberty of a democracy is not safe if the people tolerate the growth of private power to a point where it becomes stronger than the democratic state itself. That, in essence, is fascism. Ownership of government by an individual, by a group, or any controlling private power. Roosevelt knew what he was saying. Today, tomorrow, next week, next year, until the day I take my last breath, we must always be fighting for our freedoms. The empire will never voluntarily give up power or dominance. We must fight for our freedoms and rights. Thus, I ask you today, will you stand up with me? Will you speak out beside me? And will you step out with me? Together, we can bring the empire down and help create a more hopeful place where everyone, no matter their gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, or economic standing, where they can feel safe, secure, and free. Like Jesus, we must stand up, speak out, and step forward to combat the evils of empire and be champions of his justice. Amen.
Well, before I offer this blessing and benediction, thank you so much for this last month. Again, I have had a wonderful experience being with you. Uh, I hope to come back again sometime. I'm just down the street, uh, but I know that you are anxious to get Robin back into the pulpit, and I would be too because he is outstanding. So it is good to see you and be with you, and please now receive this blessing. For people of good faith, when you step from this sanctuary, you step into the world a world filled with injustice. So seek justice for the migrant. Seek justice for our fellow minorities who suffer under the oppression of empire. Seek justice for our LGBTQI plus community. Seek justice for women's reproductive rights. Seek justice for income inequality. Seek justice for the earth and all her creatures who reside on her. Let justice roll down like the waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. And let us together change the world for good. Amen. Amen.